The way we see the world is changing. The way we see ourselves is also changing. A collective shift in our understanding of the nature of consciousness and of reality itself is on the closing horizon. We will explore a new understanding that describes the interconnected nature of life. This understanding comes not from the pages of some sacred text, but from the results of carefully designed experiments performed by highly qualified scientists. I think that the understanding of uh, Psy as a real phenomenon should have enormous impacts on society as it becomes integrated. Sometimes I'm asked why, why do I spend my time looking at uh, anomalies of consciousness and my response is uh, when I give talks to, to groups and whether they're technical groups or popular groups my response is, well, why are you all here? Because oftentimes it's standing room only. And so the, the answer is that everybody's interested in these things. Who do you know who's not interested in precognition or telepathy or something? Because when it happens to an individual, there are senses that this isn't just a weird cosmic hiccup. It's something meaningful and important and interesting. Modern experiments that investigate the nature of consciousness have made surprising discoveries that challenge every model of consciousness presently held by modern science. In a scientific community that is often aggressively skeptical to these ideas, scientists such as Dean Radin have demonstrated robust and replicable evidence of psi. Despite the controversy, an increasing number of scientists from a range of fields are now beginning to acknowledge and attempt to understand these strange effects. I think that the Psy phenomena are that crucial to all of our debates and all of our major philosophical questions and are going to take us away from this purely dualistic way of dealing with the world. I think the data are pretty much uh, indisputably in support of the fact that we do interconnect, we interact, we're not isolated. Um, you know, my consciousness inside my skull, my consciousness and yours extend out into the world and they intermix. This is uh, cutting much more deeply than most people realize. That we're not simply looking at some superficial curiosities, but this stuff is erupting from some very deep and very uh, consequential characteristics of the human mind. And there are hundreds and hundreds of really good studies of Psy showing existence. And there are a smaller number of high quality studies that start to give some insight into the mechanisms of Psy or how it works. A lot of psi effects appear to, to be in the unconscious, and so we get fairly small, although reliable, effect sizes when asking people to consciously get something, but I figured that uh, if we have ways of measuring what's happening unconsciously, we might get a bigger effect. So that's how the idea came about, where you sit somebody down in front of a computer and you measure some kind of autonomic nervous system response and then you present them a series of pictures, some of which would be very calm and others would be very emotional, and see whether or not the body somehow knows that you unconsciously know what you're about to see. So I ran an experiment like that and it worked amazingly well. And I presented it at one, one of our conferences and I remember a colleague saying, well, that, that's not possible, that's way too good. So uh, fortunately he went off and replicated it almost immediately using the same pictures I was using and the same mechanism. So that was 96 and from then till now there have been 38 experiments of that type using physiological measures and uh, something like 15 laboratories, many countries and overall the results are 
extremely strong in the direction that I had originally seen. Having information about the future um, is, is really incompatible with, with that simple, obvious view that emerges directly from the nature of human experience. If it is possible for someone in the past to have definite knowledge about something in the future, then either the future is fixed or the past is malleable or some combination of the two. It's a very important experiment. We're not dealing with an assortment of curiosities that sit out here as enigmas on our understanding, but we're really getting in on the ground floor of how the mind and consciousness work, and it's a long way from what the presumptions of the so-called exact sciences are. If the physiology of our body is somehow in a dialogue with future states of itself, what does this tell us about the nature of our awareness? Could it be that consciousness is in some way blurred or spread out across time? Presentiment experiments seem to indicate that the mind is bound by a very different set of rules than those presently assumed by modern science. I have a mechanistic view of the world. I'm a physicist. My view is everything that is is contained within physics. I've worked with these psi phenomena and found things that are clearly outside of the realm of conventional physics. Well, for many years people have been interested in mind-matter interactions. And in each case, we're always looking for a very sensitive physical system. After many years of experimentation, uh, random systems seem to be the best approach. Originally tossing dice, flipping cards, things of that type. Uh, and eventually the field settled on the use of electronic random number generators, which are like electronic coin flippers. One of the ideas about what consciousness is, is an organizing principle or an organizing force. So maybe if you you project some aspect of your awareness into that system or you include that system in your own thoughts that it too would become slightly more coherent. And so the fact that we can use these generators over now over half a century and see reasonably replicable evidence suggesting there's some kind of mind-matter interaction provides a major challenge to our theories about the way that we think things work. This graph presents the cumulative data of all REG experiments conducted over nearly three decades by the Princeton Engineering Anomalies Research Laboratory, or PAIR. The statistical effect of consciousness upon these sensitive physical systems can clearly be seen. In fact, because of the sheer volume of data collected by pair, the odds of these effects occurring by chance is less than a trillion to one. You are not looking at something that's necessarily uh, some kind of weirdness in the world, but perhaps it's telling us something about the way we tend to look at the world. That if these things happen, if they occur, and they occur reasonably, reliably under controlled conditions, they're not paranormal. Uh, it's simply saying that the rules that we have for describing and understanding the world are not complete. The future hopefully is not just repeating the same experiments again and again. The question truly is, what is the mechanism by which mind as we know it can affect matter as we know it. Where do they connect? That's the real mystery and that's the question that the new generation of, of consciousness researchers, of physicists, of psychologists really have to answer. The mind can affect the world in ways unsupported by our current scientific paradigm. The data show because of the correlations, the 
consciousness is involved, human consciousness. That means that the mind is not confined to your head. It has a capacity to reach out and be in the world and to be part of the world in, in a functional and effective fashion. What's important is that there is some um, quality of uh, consciousness, some aspect of physics, which is not complete. The effects that we see in random generator studies in terms of the magnitude is pretty small. Uh, but in science, the important thing is whether something exists, not necessarily what the magnitude of the effect is. Because under a conventional theories, there shouldn't be any relationship at all between what's going on inside your head and what's going on outside the world. I often say it's a small effect, so small that you shouldn't think uh, you're going to be able to switch channels on your TV by thinking about it. That smallness of effect is uh, absolutely not what's important when you think about implications in science. Even the small effects that we've been able to show in the laboratory are kind of a wedge uh, into the mainstream position, still largely materialistic or physicalist position, that really doesn't work anymore. And, and science even knows it. Um, you know, physics doesn't really hold to it anymore, but somehow it still remains as this kind of general worldview that we're all caught in. Already the evidence shows that there's something that happens when very large numbers of people come together. The Global Consciousness Project is a, an outgrowth of original studies looking at whether or not random generator effects uh, involving consciousness could be seen in the large, rather than just one person in a laboratory. Uh, and it grew out of an idea that Roger Nelson had uh, back in the mid-90s, where he would take a random generator and put it in the vicinity of a group that was doing something coherent as a group, like meditation. And we, I, I was replicating studies, and he was reporting studies, and a bunch of us were beginning to see these effects. And we got together one time and decided that we, we should have an ongoing study so we didn't have to all get together and run our random number generators, but just to have them going all the time. So the Global Consciousness Project was designed to look at the possibility that humans, when they're brought to a common focus of attention by a disaster or a celebration, um, that, uh, that could create something new in the same way, a kind of group consciousness of millions of people all feeling the same kinds of emotions in a kind of synchronized way. And now after 13 years or so of data, it looks like the answer is yes. That large-scale events do cause a moment of coherence, unexpected coherence, and a network of random generators running around the world. We change the correlation matrix of a network that's scattered all over the world. We change it. It isn't uh, random anymore. Those devices that are separated by thousands of kilometers are suddenly acting more like each other than they should by chance. The uh, September 11th uh, event is uh, widely known as one of the things that's kind of emblematic of the Global Consciousness Project. It's, um, in some uh, respects, the biggest event that we've looked at. And it turns out, in fact, it manifests the potential to change the world. We did an awful lot of analysis on that. <clears throat> some of those analyses are and just striking in the way the data look. It really had a correspondingly strong effect on our data. And there are some odd features like the fact that at least one of those measures started changing about four or five hours before the first plane hit. I think probably the, the relationship between the mind and the environment is uh, one of the big areas to be uh, examined 
and reevaluated with uh, the research that's going on and that really the research that needs to, to take place. We do have an unexplained impact on these devices, meaning that we do have an unexplained impact or influence on the world around us. Over the past 50 years, independent researchers around the world have evidenced the apparent ability of our minds to influence the behavior of sensitive physical instruments to gain information outside of conventional channels and for our consciousness to coalesce with other minds. These mysterious though replicable phenomena have become known by researchers as psi effects and if they are real, their implications to our understanding of the mind will be far-reaching. One of the inspirations for experiments in, in psi research is to listen carefully to what people report in their daily life. And one of those effects is the feeling of being stared at, which many people can relate to and many don't even consider to be psi. The, the phenomena is that you're sitting somewhere minding your own business and you get an uncomfortable feeling that somebody's staring at you, you turn and you look and sure enough someone's staring at you. If most people have noticed that they can tell when they're being stared at by others, why should anyone assume they're wrong? Why not find out if they're right? So in the laboratory, what you can do is test to see whether there may be a psi component to that. You can do one of two basic types of experiments, one where you consciously are asked to respond whether someone looking or not, and sometimes they are and sometimes they're not. And the other one is that you wire up the person being stared at to look at their unconscious physiological uh, movements during times when people are staring at them and when they're not. And both of those classes of studies show that, that people, on average, can either tell consciously or their body will indicate that they're being stared at. This graph shows the results of 60 experiments, and it consists of over 33,000 trials. Chance predicts a hit rate of 50%, but as the graph shows, participants are aware of another person's attention trained upon them approximately 54% of the time. This, like other psi effects, is relatively small in magnitude, but it is consistent and highly statistically significant. Like any extraordinary claim in science, these findings are subject to a great amount of skepticism. The graph shows all published studies, but what about the unpublished studies? Could there be a selective reporting bias? One method we can use to check this involves mapping all known studies into a funnel plot. Using a statistical heuristic known as Truman Fill, we can check to see if the studies are distributed evenly. An uneven distribution can be indicative of missing studies. This analysis does allude to a publication bias for this experiment and indicates the likelihood of six unreported studies. With the addition of these hypothetical studies, the overall effect size is slightly reduced. However, it is still astonishingly statistically significant, with odds against chance at 1 in 10 to the 46th. 1,417 unreported studies showing no effect would be required to nullify this effect size. The only sensible explanation is that there is an effect. There's something uh, much more in the interaction than just the, the, the sensory modes that we're familiar with. What they are, we don't know yet. So I think that when we interact with other consciousnesses, other living people, creatures, etc. Uh, this research suggests that there is sort of perhaps a richer interaction than we normally think about. What we're looking at here is just the necessity for a radical new revolution in how we think consciousness operates in the world. I think a lot of phenomena that at present seem paranormal actually seem perfectly normal as soon as we adopt the idea of the extended mind.
In the 1970s, at around the same time, several psychologists became interested in the prospect of a new kind of psi experiment. This new experiment will be based on the idea that by placing the mind into a state of sensory deprivation, subtle extrasensory information, normally lost amid the noise of ordinary awareness, may become available to the conscious mind. The researchers had good reasons to think that altered states may be more conducive to psi effects in the laboratory. Practicing meditation, dreaming, under the influence of psychoactive drugs or at the verge of sleep are all states that feature frequently in accounts of psi experiences. The researchers would make use of a specific type of sensory deprivation technique developed in the 1930s by German psychologist Wolfgang Metzger. This technique is known as the Gansfeld. Uh, the Gansfeld was created as a way of putting the receiver in a condition which is not an ordinary state of awareness, but more like dreaming or a, hy a hypnagogic state. And the reason was that most spontaneous psychic experiences, like precognitive dreams, telepathy, and so on, they occur not in an ordinary state of awareness, but in a state where, in essence, the frontal lobes are sort of gone to sleep, and the, the rest of the brain, the rest of the mind, is engaged in other things. It seems to be simply more open at that time. For a sender-receiver design, testing for telepathy, you put the receiver under a red light in, in a comfy chair and they wear headphones listening to white noise or pink noise and they put half ping pong balls over their eyes and keep their eyes open. And they're encouraged to speak aloud anything that comes to mind. And meanwhile, the sender is shown uh, one picture or one video clip selected out of a pool of such clips and asked to mentally send that to the receiver. The four targets are selected beforehand so that they're as different from each other as possible. And this, of course the receiver has no idea what's in the target pool and the experimenter doesn't know either. In some designs the sender can hear what the receiver is speaking aloud and they can use that then as a kind of a feedback the sender can because they can try to adjust their mental sending strategy to make the receiver say what they're trying to send. After 20 or 30 minutes of that, you take the receiver out of the Gansfeld condition uh, and that person will see four targets, one of which was the one the sender was trying to send, and three decoys. So the experimenter will interview the receiver and help them evoke their imagery and then say, well, you have four possible choices. Which one do you think is the one that's best matching it? So they have a one in four chance and they select one and it's either a hit or a miss because it either matches what was being sent or not. So that experiment has been done hundreds of times now over about 40 years and by chance you would expect 25% and what you get across the board is roughly 32%. So this very simple method, which takes 20 minutes or so to get somebody into the right state, uh, does seem to work. And it works better than, an, than somebody in an ordinary state of awareness. The Gansfeld experiments were born out of a dialogue between skeptics and psi researchers, with skeptics rightly to be considered the architects of this experimental design. This graph displays the results of 88 Gansfeld studies, and consists of over 3,000 trials. The dotted line displays the 25% hit rate anticipated by chance. However, the actual hit rate is much higher than this, approximately 32%. If we place all the studies into a funnel plot, like we did with the staring experiments, we can check the likelihood of a publication bias. This graph shows studies evenly distributed around the effect size, which indicates that a publication bias cannot explain this effect. This area of psi research is extraordinarily statistically significant, with odds against chance at 29 quintillion to 1. Consciousness is a provider of information. Consciousness is a source. It says you're dealing with something here that gives you the capacity for acquiring information irrespective of space and time. These are simply hints.
is, as anomalies have always been in the history of science, that your science is not complete yet. Uh, and when you go back through the whole history of science, you find it's been driven by phenomena that don't fit the rules. The analysis of the Gansfeld experiments provides further fascinating insights into the extended qualities of mind and the nature of consciousness. Complex imagery transmitted between minds alludes not only to a mysterious interaction between conscious beings, it further challenges our notions of the ownership of our perceptions. The lines between our subjective inner worlds, our environments and those we interact with become ever more blurred. More and more it seems that our consciousness is less a private projection but more a refinement from a common interaction, a pervasive, perhaps intrinsic aspect of reality. famous scientists say, well, if this was true, we have to throw out all of physics and start over again. Nobody wants the standard model in physics to be overthrown. We don't think it's necessary to overthrow the model. We think it's necessary to enhance and um, increase the capacity of the model. That's all. Why then is this not generally recognized? Well, part of the reason is that science is fractured into so many different disciplines that no scientist working in their own discipline is, is expected to know what's happening even in an adjacent discipline. When I present this kind of data to neuroscientists, even if they're open to the idea, they'll, just, they'll be skeptical, which is fine, but they, they will say, well, this probably isn't true because it doesn't match what I know about physics. But they don't know about physics. I mean, they even admit it. They don't understand enough about physics to know that, but they somehow feel in, intuitively that it doesn't match physics. And then I'll talk to physicists who will say, well, it's allowed by physics, but that doesn't match what I know about the neurosciences or biology. Well, they don't know about neurosciences and biology. And this, this is, again, part of the problem of the fracturing of disciplines, that we, we can spend a lot of time working on our own discipline. And realistically today, for a working scientist knows a huge amount in very great depth about a very tiny slice. And so, in a sense, what I've become is a generalist. I know a fair amount about psi, but I've also had to learn at least a little bit about most other disciplines. So I, I, I have some sense about at least what are the, what's the dogma and the doctrines in various disciplines. And when you do that, you take this, this high-level approach across the board, you find that actually there's no incompatibilities at all. There are some challenges to existing assumptions, but they're just assumptions. Everything in science is an assumption. So the next step may be to, to continue to reach younger people who are not quite as admired in, in previous ideas about how things ought to work and enlighten them about the nature of the evidence. We've looked at a small number of existing Psi experiments that explore these effects from a range of different approaches. We saw in the pre-sentiment experiments that our awareness is spread out across time and that our minds may follow a different set of rules than those of classical physics. We saw in the experiments of the Princeton Engineering Anomalies Research Laboratory that through a purely mental volition, consciousness increases the order in physical systems beyond any presently known scientific explanation. We also explored the Global Consciousness Project that seemed to indicate that when drawn to the same focus, our consciousness may be able to coalesce with other minds. We saw in the sense of being stared at experiments that people could be both pre-consciously and consciously aware of another mind trained upon them. And in the Gansfeld, we saw that complex imagery could be projected from one mind to another despite shielding from all sensory and electromagnetic signaling. Together, this research builds a new description of consciousness and its place in the world. These experiments infer that consciousness is not just a smoke and mirrors illusion of the brain, but exists somehow on the same continuum as physical reality. 
These experiments allude to the profound realization that all subjectivity may have its roots in a much deeper process. Our personal consciousness, it now seems, is a refinement from the fundamental characteristic of reality. assortment of curiosities that sit out here as enigmas on our understanding, but we're really getting in on the ground floor of how the mind and consciousness work, and it's a long way from what the presumptions of the so-called exact sciences are. And since all of these anomalous phenomena involve consciousness, they involve the subjective dimension of experience, uh, the message that comes through is that if we are going to understand reality, we have to look at the subjective side as well as the objective side. No matter how big or small that effect is, the fact that the mind can have, or intention, or anything subjective about consciousness and the human being and their state can have an influence on processes that quantum mechanics says should be intrinsically random. Uh, that fact is extraordinarily significant because it it kind of cuts at the roots of our entire common sense understanding of the physical world. There may be an observer-driven component to reality. That's really the bottom line for a lot of this research. I think uh, Psy is uh, very important for the long-standing philosophical debates uh, that relate to uh, mind-body, um, the nature of consciousness as a factor in the world, whether there are some fundamental characteristics and, and capabilities of consciousness. And I do think that it will advance that uh, debate in a way that takes it from thousands of years of speculation to where we will actually have some answers.